Thank you, thank you. So as I uh, said, in the following I would like um, to study different class of models, uh, topological models, and uh, discuss a few aspects. So let me directly uh, jump in. So these are uh, the type of models we I will consider in the following. Essentially non-interacting fermions, tr translational invariants such that we can decompose the Hamiltonian into uh, different uh, momenta or quasi-momenta when you have an underlying lattice Hamiltonian. So here, uh, overall, it means the Hamiltonian decomposes into um, uh, different components uh, for each momentum K. And the Hamiltonian for a given momentum K can be written in this quadratic form where this CK is a spinner and depending on uh, what, is, what are the microscopic details, uh, the spinner can be like uh, of this form where the Cs are fermionic annihilation operators that might correspond to different sublattices in real space A and B, or you could have a spinner of this form which you might well know when you uh, are familiar with uh, uh, Kitaev models. But actually, so the details are not so important. Just keep in mind that uh, these are models of non-interacting fermions with translation invariants. Um, there's an additional symmetry imposed here, which is particle, some particle hole symmetry, which somehow will be important later on. Now, the, due to this uh, decoupling into different momentum uh, sectors, the actual information about the physical properties of the given model is solely uh, contained uh, in this uh, matrix HK, which uh, is typically uh, in this Bogolubov de Gen formulation uh, expressed in terms of this uh, vector uh, D um, and this vector of Pauli matrices tau. Uh, essentially, this matrix uh, HK is a two by two matrix, which you can express, express in terms of Pauli matrices in this form. This is something you might well know from <clears throat> your quantum mechanics course. And uh, yes, all the information is contained in HK or in this equivalently in this vector DK. This is just to set the stage. Yeah, and one example, if you are familiar with the one-dimensional Kitaev chain, for example, then uh, this vector dk would, for example, have this form where delta is the, uh, the, the, the pairing amplitude, mu is the chemical potential of the fermions, and j is uh, some nearest neighbor hopping. But actually, the only thing that I will use throughout the talk here is that non-interacting fermions and translation invariants that uh, everything decomposes into different momentum sectors. Um, the Hamiltonian can then be diagonalized for each momentum separately, so, which means you diagonalize a two by two matrix, which you can do essentially analytically. Um, despite of course, it, this makes these problems analytically uh, easy, rather easily tractable. There is a further important property I will use, and that is because the different momentum se sectors are decoupled in the Hamiltonian, uh, it also implies that the ground state of, um, or also excited states actually, of, of the system factorize also in different momen momentum sectors. Um, as uh, illustrated here. Um, when you do now time evolution, that's what we are interested in in the following mainly, this does also not change. So as long as the Hamiltonian which is doing the time evolution is also of non-interacting uh, form and uh, has translational invariance so that we can essentially um, study the problem for each momentum separately. So if we have such an expression for our time-evolved uh, state, um, again, 
due to translation invariance, also this low Schmidt amplitude in the end factorizes is everything in these models. So we can write this low Schmidt amplitude as a product of different momenta, where this low Schmidt amplitude for a given k is nothing but the uh, overlap of the time evolved wave function, single particle wave function at the given momentum k and its overlap with the initial condition, okay? So now let us use one of the um, insights I was pre presenting you in the, uh, yesterday, which is that uh, dynamic phase transitions are associated with zeros of the partition function. Um, at that point, it was m mostly uh, a way to argue on general grounds that these quantities can be non-analytic. Here we can uh, actually also make use of it because um, to determine conditions um, for when we can have a dynamical phase transition in this kind of models, uh, since we have uh, to require that at a dynamical transition, um, the partition function, or here this low Schmidt amplitude at this critical time has to vanish exactly, has to be zero. But since this is a product, it also means that it's equivalent of saying that there is at least one uh, what is called critical momentum, k star, which at this time t star or this amplitude becomes zero. So in order to, uh, um, to um, um, study whether this given protocol supports a dynamic transition, you would just have to solve for, for this condition, which is rather easy to analyze for a concrete model. And now for, um, now that's where topology now comes in. When you have these two bands, Bogolubov uh, degen models with particle hole symmetry, it turns out actually that there are uh, rather general statements about when these dynamical phase transitions can occur. And it turns out that they are rather uh, strongly related to the underlying equilibrium ground state properties of the model. Although we are studying a system far away from equilibrium at energy densities which are far beyond, of the, ground, uh, far beyond the ground state. For example, we are, there are proofs which show that um, in one dimension, um, <clears throat> We always have to get dynamical phase transi transitions in, this, in these models when uh, our initial and final Hamiltonian are topologically different. So have ground states which are of di different topological nature. Um, in two dimensions, the uh, situations, situation is slightly different. Um, it's not sufficient in general to have just a different uh, um, uh, topologically different ground states, but actually the absolute value of the churn number has to differ. <clears throat> and then we are guaranteed to have these dynamical phase transitions. Okay? And this you can deduce just from, uh, in the end, it's not very difficult from, uh, from uh, checking under which conditions, uh, uh, conditions this equation can be satisfied in. So, um, in the end, there is now a rather general understanding where, whether these, for two-band models, for high bands, it's actually much, much more non-trivial. Um, for two-band models, um, under which conditions these dynamic trans transitions can appear. Yes? Yes, so that the ground states of the two respective Hamiltonians would have different churn numbers, say, or different absolute value uh, uh, of the churn number. And um, actually, this can be, especially in one dimension, for example, uh, it, uh, this strong connection between the equilibrium and dynamic transitions can be used to 
uh, detect, for example, equilibrium ground state phase boundaries by just studying dynamical phase transitions. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there. In two dimensions, uh, it's not yet settled. Sorry. Yes? So, Marcus, but you're, you're assuming that the band is exactly filled. So, half filling, you have, yes, okay. yes. So, there is yeah. no partial filling, this will happen also if there are two probably equal at the point. Yeah, so like that's here the assumption. Yeah, half filling is the assumption, yes. Yes? It can happen, but you're not guaranteed that it happens. So in some sense, they are not like, uh, when you can satisfy one of these two conditions here, your dynamical transition to some extent is topologically protected. So you have to, have to get it. In other cases, you might also get it, but uh, then it might depend on fine tuning. Okay, and now um, I promised you this uh, already quite a lot of times. For these classes of models, we can now construct um, some uh, order parameters. And the basic uh, underlying um, quantity we need for that is something which has also different names. I will use uh, the notion of a Pancharatnam geometric phase. It's a generalization of Berry phase to non-adiabatic, uh, non-cyclic uh, evolution. So it measures, gives you a geometric content of uh, uh, geometric, a geometric content of um, two non-orthogonal um, states. And uh, uh, this goes as follows. So um, since so we know already that the overall low Schmidt amplitude factorizes, so we can study uh, it at each individual uh, momentum separately. And this is what I've been writing down here. Let's do a polar de decomposition of that object. So in terms of an um, absolute value and a phase. So this phase now um, is nothing but the phase uh, acquired uh, during non-equilibrium evolution starting from this initial condition. Yeah? So RK measures the overall probability, or R square measures the probability of uh, returning to your initial condition, and phi K measures the uh, phase acquired during your non-equilibrium protocol. Yes, that's what I've been writing, what is written down here. Um, now it's important, as you're maybe familiar from, from Barry's phase, um, this phase acquired, although you're not doing a cyclic path in your, in, uh, in your parameter space or Hilbert space, this phase contains a purely ge geometric part and uh, goes under the same, along the same lines as for, for various phase. When you subtract a dynamical contribution, which in our case is nothing but the uh, what you expect, like uh, linearly increasing in time uh, phase where uh, the prefactor is given by essentially the, uh, the corresponding energy of the mode. And this is now this celebrated Pancharatnam geometric phase. It's the geometric content of a non-adiabatic phase acquired by the system for a given momentum. And now comes a crucial point, and that's actually the only point where uh, topological properties start to be important. Now let me consider in the following just a one-dimensional case first. And now comes the important point when you have particle hole symmetry, this Pancharatnam geometric phase you can show is pinned for two different momenta namely for, men, for momentum k equals zero and for momentum k equal to pi. I said uh, implicitly uh, lattice spacing equal to one here. Um, and it's pinned exactly to zero. So what, what does that mean? It means that as a function of momentum, uh, this phase uh, describes a closed loop on, on a circle. And for closed loops on a circle, we can define a winding number. And since they are closed loops, and that's uh, 
ensured by this uh, condition, the winding number, of course, has to be an integer. Okay? And as it turns out, this uh, integer um, is uh, a order parameter for these dynamic uh, transitions. So you can then show that um, whenever a dynamic phase transition occurs, uh, this winding number has to change its quantized, uh, its integer value. And the way maybe to see that, why this phase can change at, uh, at a, a dynamic phase transition, let me quickly maybe go back. I forgot to put this on the slide. Um, I told you that on an even previous slide that the condition for having a dynamic transition is that there is one momentum for which at a given time this low Schmidt amplitude becomes exactly zero. And when this low Schmidt amplitude becomes exactly zero, of course, the phase becomes undefined and can change its value. And that is then uh, reflected in the change of this, um, of this winding number. Let me show some uh, data. Here on the left-hand side, you can see this is a, a, Kitaev, a quantum quenchian, a, a Kitaev chain, a one-dimensional Kitaev chain. And here you can see as a function of time, momentum resolved the Pancharatnam geometric phase. On the one hand, you can see the spinning at k equals zero and at k equal pi that the Pancharatnam phase is always zero. And you can see that uh, your, um, depending on which time you're looking at, the, uh, your uh, winding number um, starts to increase. So here is definitely the phase is almost zero everywhere, so there's no winding number associated to that. But for example, here we, uh, we start uh, to cross once through uh, the full circle. We, uh, we cover once the full circle, so we get a winding number of, of one. And indeed, here on the right-hand side, you can see this is the lambda, the, uh, that I was uh, the rate function of the Schmidt echo and the corresponding uh, winding number. And whenever you have a dynamic transition here, 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 and so on, you see that this uh, uh, winding number jumps here by a value of, of one. Now, this construction is very general um, for these two-band models. Whenever you have a two-band model with particle host symmetry, you can define this winding number, and whenever you have a dynamic transition, you, uh, you can show you have to have a change of this value, so it can operate as a winding number. So the more interesting case maybe is even the two-dimensional case. You can define also a Pancharatnam geometric phase for two dimensions, um, of course then, um, your Brion zone is not a one-dimensional object as before, but rather two-dimensional. That's why you see here uh, two-dimensional color plots. So these are the two. This is Kx and Ky. And as a color scale, you see here some phase. It's actually not the Pancharatnam phase, but something which is equivalent. Um, and in two dimensions, you, of course, don't have directly a winding number, but the, uh, you also see um, the emergence of some topological, uh, like topological uh, defects, namely that whenever you have a dynamic phase transition, you uh, see the appearance or disappearance of vortices in this uh, phase profile. So here, um, uh, this is actually also, uh, this is experimental data of, uh, oh, um, obtained in a system of ultra cold atoms in the uh, group of Christoph Weitenberg and Klaus Sengstock. You see uh, this azimuthal phase, but uh, it's what you see is equivalent to the Pancharatnam phase, um, resolved over the full Brion zone for different times here. And uh, what you observe at specific points in time that here uh, enclosed by these uh, red circles pairs of vortices in this phase profile appear, they walk around, and at some point they recombine uh, and uh, vanish completely again. So when you measure, for example, the, the number of uh, dynamically generated vortices, you would uh, find zero initially, then 
one pair is generated, two, and then at some point they recombine and will disappear again. So in one dimension, summarizing one dimension for these models, we have, uh, we can define rather generally this winding number, whereas in two dimensions, um, you can define this uh, uh, number of uh, dynamically generated vortices um, that have to appear whenever you have a dynamical transition in such two-band models. Yes? No, that's momentum space. So that's a vortex in momentum space. This is KY and this is KX. And yeah, please. So uh, these red circles enclose a vortex. So a structure when you measure this phase uh, uh, in a circle around this, this core, you would find that you get a one non-zero winding. Yes? Um, so you mean what, uh, what sets the location, for example? That is fixed by, um, by these critical momenta that I mentioned on the previous slide. So there's, uh, for a given a model and given initial condition, final Hamiltonian, they're fixed to appear at certain positions. And also like the, the move they take along certain lines, that's all uh, determined by uh, initial and final, yeah, initial state and final Hamiltonian in the end. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so like, um, mm -hmm, good question. So like, uh, in the end, uh, actually there should be some symmetry in these plots, but the experiments were actually, uh, were not realizing the symmetry required here. That, so they were not uh, good enough in realizing the Hamiltonians that you would uh, observe the same vortices appearing also uh, at some other, other, uh, other places of the Brion zone. So that was, um, in the ideal case, there uh, would be more of these vortices, but in the experiment, they were not able to realize it as perfect as they would have done it. Yeah, please. Sorry, say it again. Yes. Um, I sorry, I think I didn't get your point. So you, you mean this uh, this plot here, and there should be you mean there should be some symmetry involved here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be, but it's not realized here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. The the point is, <clears throat> in principle, yeah. In principle, there should be some relation. Uh, this one here, they realized, is probably not one of these topologically protected ones where you can make strong statements, but more, uh, a dynamical transition which requires more fine tuning, and there we cannot make as general statements as for the, for the other ones. But otherwise, it's related to, uh, as you say, to I think, to uh, to the difference in absolute value of churn number or something like that. I'm not 100% sure, honestly. So there should, uh, I'm not 100% sure, I'm sorry. No, no, no. 
at least within some range. It does not depend on that. Okay, so now um, I won't like. I would like to come now to a um, to my last part, which I, uh, which is a very very recent experiment, uh, two three weeks ago was put in the archive, which I uh, an application which I like actually quite a lot, and that is about um, quantum walks, <clears throat> and how to use the um, the. Uh, the insights that I've already presented you before can be used um, to characterize such processes. So let me first say what quantum walks are and why I think that this is an interesting uh, application. So um, overall, a quantum walk is a very, like, um, rather simple um, quantum process. It's the quantum analog of a classical random walk. Uh, it goes as follows, you have some lattice, or like, I will only consider now a discrete quantum walks, there are also continuous ones which are uh, not constrained to lattice sides, but rather live in the continuum. So in a quantum walk, uh, you have a lattice, as indicated here in real space. Um, you have some internal space, which is uh, typically called a coin space. It just means that at each lattice side, there are two degrees, uh, internal degrees of freedom, which we label by up and down. And um, initially, before we start the process, we uh, put one particle um, on uh, one particular lattice side, which we, which we typically choose as zero. So one excitation here, in some superposition of this in, in this internal coin state up and down, and then, according to some protocol I will show you in the next slide, we, will, we just let the system evolve. But it's a single particle problem. Let me also emphasize this here. Okay. Um, I will consider a specific class of quantum walks, which are called split-step quantum walks. Um, they uh, have the following uh, show, the, or the dynamics is governed by the following sequence of individual uh, gates. So first of all, you do some uh, rotation R uh, in the internal coin, sp uh, coin space. So you somehow uh, uh, redistribute your amplitudes between up and down on, a on all your lattice sides. Then you do a conditional shift uh, by this T up operator. What it does, it moves your uh, particle, your walker, uh, one lattice side to the right, but only if uh, under the condition that the particle is in state up locally. Okay? And when it, the system, when for those, <clears throat> when, the, when the particle is, is in, in state down, it does nothing. Then there comes another rotation uh, with some angle theta 2 uh, in this coin space, and then we do a conditional shift uh, again, but now um, precisely opposite, we move the walker to the left when uh, the walker is in state down, only then. If it's in up, we don't do anything. And now what we do is this is one step of your quantum walk, and then we repeatedly uh, apply the same sequence and essentially study how this single particle uh, dis starts to distribute among your lattice, which is initially a particle which is initially localized. So now um, um, you can think of uh, this problem in a different way, namely that it's an effectively periodic time dependent problem. So you have some sequence of uh, four operations and these four operations you, op uh, you repeat on and on and on in a periodic fashion in the end. Um, for such sequences, <clears throat> or periodic sequences, um, you can uh, equivalently think of a Hamiltonian formulation. So before the operations for the evolution I was showing you uh, were not, I didn't show you any Hamiltonian. These were just operations on a particle itself. But you can uh, think of defining uh, a Hamiltonian, a flocky Hamiltonian, HF, which uh, 
generates the same dynamics, or Hamiltonian, which generates the same dynamics as the full unitary U here. Um, and now, of course, you could ask yourself, how does, what properties does this Hamiltonian have? Um, this is somehow shown here. There's a phase diagram for this Hamiltonian, depending on these two angles, theta 1 and theta 2, which describe the internal rotation um, in the coin space. And you find some phase boundaries here um, between uh, topologically uh, non-trivial, like, oh, so you can find a phase diagram um, uh, for, uh, for the following situation. So like this HF actually mimics uh, models that we had, I have discussed uh, on the uh, previous part, like momentum is a good quantum number for this perfect lattice. So also this HF decomposes in different momentum sectors and it's a non-interacting single particle problem. Uh, this HF therefore looks like as uh, a model that uh, would be realized by uh, non-interacting particles in solids for an insulator, say, or for a topological insulator. And for that, we can write down a phase diagram, or we can determine a phase diagram. And it shows also topologically non-trivial phases. That's why the split-step quantum walk is, uh, has attracted uh, quite some attention. And there are also topologically trivial phases. But you have to keep in mind, this is a single particle problem. So uh, you're not dealing with uh, ground states of a half-filled uh, half -filled, uh, um, quantum anybody system. It's a single particle which is moving on your lattice. So it does not make sense to think about ground state properties or churn numbers a priori for this problem, okay? So now that leads us to the challenge. Now what, uh, it's an inherent dynamical process, a quantum walk. You prepare your particle locally and then it starts to spread. There is no equilibrium asso state associated to a quantum walk. The particle will just move somewhere. In contrast to classical random walks, there's not even a limiting distribution. So there's not a, uh, there's not a, uh, uh, there's no steady state for that problem. There's no distribution asymptotically this particle will uh, attain. So the, uh, there's nothing which one can think of a steady state or a, some equilibrium state you can associate to that problem. So how can we then characterize <clears throat> such an inherent dynamical process for which we uh, don't have, cannot apply any thermodynamics or something else? And of course, you will probably guess that uh, uh, so there will be somehow a connection to dynamical phase transitions, not directly because also these dynamical transitions only occur in a thermodynamic limit. Here we have a single particle, uh, but uh, we can still do the following. So now uh, let me discuss a bit the state of, your, of this quantum walker. So that's the wave function, psi, uh, after t time steps. Um, you can write it as a superposition uh, in the following way, where x denotes uh, a spatial point on your lattice and mu the internal coin space, so which can be up or down. So that's now the space, the basis in which I expand. And the system has a, a respective amplitude uh, to be at uh, a given time step t at this position x and uh, having uh, this particular in, uh, value mu for the internal coin space. We could also think, um, so that's now a real space uh, representation of that. Uh, momentum here is a good quantum number or quasi-momentum, crystal momentum. We can also equivalent, equivalently, equivalently think about the uh, momentum space representation of that. So we can just Fourier transform these uh, amplitudes, which gives us this uh, psi tk of mu, and now in momentum basis. Um, and now let us define performing the sum over the internal coin space to uh, get 
a, the wave function of the quantum walker at a given momentum, okay? involving both of the internal possible um, uh, orientations in the, in the coin space. So that our final wave function has this form. So it's just a sum over all these momentum components. So as opposed to the previous one, like uh, when I, I was discussing in the previous section, the state was a product over different momentum sectors. The quantum walker is now a superposition over the different momentum sectors. But formally, that's actually the only difference. So it's a superposition in terms of, uh, instead of a product. So now, we could equivalently think of the Loh-Schmidt amplitude at a given momentum. It does not make sense to think about a many-body wave function, but still we can think about a Loh-Schmidt amplitude at a given momentum. So we can uh, again define our phase acquired at a, different, at a given momentum, and also can uh, think about a Pancharatnam geometric phase, and we can uh, think about a, this dynamical topological order parameter, which does not require to have a many-body wave function. It does only need to have a phase which depends on momentum and which performs closed loops on a circle. But this we can define equival equivalently for a quantum walk. For that, we don't need a many-body wave function. So it's still a single particle problem, but of course there's an equivalent partner, a many body system, where you replace the superposition by a product, okay? But in this way we can now transfer everything I was telling you uh, before now to this, to this quantum work problem. And now what you can see here on the left hand side is uh, uh, an experiment where this uh, dynamical topological order parameter here denoted by uh, WD was measured for a quantum walk. And uh, you see here that um, this um, dynamical uh, topological order parameter can uh, behave differently uh, depending on which uh, parameters you choose in your split-step quantum walk. Um, here you see again the, the phase diagram, hypothetical phase diagram of the model. It would have an equilibrium if it would be a quantum anybody system and if it would acquire a steady state. Um, so that these, like, these, um, these, uh, <coughs> or the, diff the different parameter sets are here indicated by different symbols and you find them also in the respective, <clears throat> respective plots. Now, uh, what, they were, what they managed to do in the experiment, or like this is something, something uh, uh, in, uh, very uh, interesting also uh, concern when you want to connect to these dynamical uh, transitions, is that there are certain lines in parameter space here where the, your Hamiltonian, this effective Flocky Hamiltonian would have flat bands so that eigenstates are, uh, uh, are localized objects in real space. This you can only have for flat, uh, for flat bands. So if you uh, choose your uh, initial state properly, you can think about that it corresponds to, uh, to uh, prepare your system in some eigenstate of uh, a Hamiltonian, which is single particle eigenstate of the Hamiltonian uh, in, this, in this phase diagram. And now you do dynamics uh, at different uh, values of uh, at different parameter sets here and here and here. And as you can see, so this is the phase boundary of the hypothetical equilibrium problem. You see that for the star and the square, this uh, topological order parameter always stays, stays zero throughout uh, the dynamical process. And as soon as you cross uh, the hypothetical equilibrium phase boundary, 
the uh, triangle and the circle, you see that now the, uh, uh, this uh, dynamical topological order parameter starts to show uh, uh, jumps and to show an increase. So below here, these red, uh, red uh, uh, data is the rate function of the equivalent many body system, but I think, so let me emphasize, I think it's not correct here to think about a many body system. It's a single particle problem for which you can nevertheless define a dynamical topological order parameter, um, which is this uh, omega d. And with this, you can now uh, characterize different uh, dynamical properties your uh, quantum walk can have, so qualitatively different properties. So either your, um, your uh, 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 omega d can stay constant or it can increase. There are even uh, more complicated processes that can appear, but for, that, uh, for these parameter sets, you can only have these two options. And for example, it allows you to get even information about the hypothetical phase diagram of uh, um, uh, this effective Floquet Hamiltonian, although you never are in any of, uh, are far away from that in terms of uh, energy density or uh, you're seeing a, studying a single particle problem. And there are also actually many other experiments uh, on similar problem, uh, similar, uh, similar. Uh, Scenarios like quantum walks or single particle uh, qubit um, experiments which see similar uh, properties. Okay, so what, let, let me just summarize this part. So um, the, for me this is like a, a prime example of a, of, of a quantum process the quantum walk, which in, in, in no way has any equilibrium, uh, uh, equilibrium meaning, so there is, not, uh, there is not even a limiting distribution in some long time limit, even uh, furthermore it's a single particle process. But nevertheless, the knowledge we had from these dynamical transitions, we have been able to dynamically characterize the uh, the time evolution. Okay, and with that, I'm actually uh, too early at the end of, of, of the lecture. Um, so let me just very briefly uh, close, like I, uh, with a summary and some open questions. So I give you gave you a rather detailed introduction into this concept of dynamical phase transitions. I showed you some central properties and also. Uh, today started to give you some hints towards interpreting this phenomenon. I discussed also uh, quite a lot of ex experiments that have been done in this uh, direction. So it's not, uh, it is also a, an experimentally observable phenomenon. But there are also many, many uh, open questions and some of the big ones I've been uh, listing here. So that the first one is the most, one of the most pressing ones and that is why is the equilibrium, also like the equilibrium theory of phase transitions so successful? Mainly because we have effective descriptions in terms of Landau or effective field theories. So we have some first attempts for particular models, but we are very far away from having something uh, equivalent. So to see whether, to which extent we can find uh, analogs of Landau or field theories, effective macroscopic descriptions for such phenomena that would be uh, very important. Second very important aspect is higher dimensions. So many of the things that I've been showing you were essentially one dimensional problems. Maybe two dimensions for uh, exactly solvable two dimensional uh, problems but we also know in equilibrium that many of the interesting um, phase trans phases or phase uh, transition phenomena occur not in one dimension, but rather in interacting systems in two and three dimensions. And for that, we just don't know at the moment 
uh, how uh, to compute the dynamics. So that's more like a computational problem and how to compute this low Schmidt amplitude which has the complexity of a full partition function uh, but maybe even worse because you have to deal with complex numbers so Monte Carlo will not help you probably in general because you immediately run into sign problems. Uh, and may, another thing is uh, order parameters. So for, the, for these topological systems we have somehow an understanding but uh, away from that we are lacking a lot of uh, insight in this direction and so like there are many dots many points I could add there for these dots and uh, with this I'd like to uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, quite a long time here and hope you will enjoy future lectures too. Sure.